Okay, so welcome back to our final session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So welcome back to our final session um, before our keynote speaker. I'm Danielle Cannon, the new strategy manager for the Institute of Public Health, for those who haven't met me yet. And please do come and talk to me at a later date. Um, so my new role is to support Carol and also the Institute uh, in its entirety and leading a small team. Um, and I'm not entirely sure if everyone knows everyone, but I'd like to introduce Tenny Vidler, who is the Public Health Network Leader, as well as a Funding Coordinator. Lauren Milden, who's our Policy Coordinator, and Rosa Atwood, standing at the back, who's our Comms Manager. So I just wanted to introduce them and say thanks for organising all this. So without further ado, we will start our panel session. And this is really to answer some of your pre-submitted questions. But as well as that, I'd like to take some more, because if not, you'll just be listening to us talking. So I think we'll make it a bit more dynamic at this time of the day. Um, so I'd like to bring forward Carol Brain, Director of the Institute. Um, and we've all heard from Carol today. Um, we'd like to welcome back up Nick Wareham, who's the Director of MRC, FE and CEDAR. <laughs> Mike Kelly, if you wouldn't mind coming back up again. <laughs> Thank you, our senior visiting fellow. And last but not least, if we could bring back Katie Cow, who's a professor of gerontology at the Department of Primary Care. <laughs> so I've been tasked with trying to merge all your questions into some logical sessions. And so what I've attempted to do is split it up into future, data science, and then engagement, which kept cropping up all today. So I think just to start off, from what you've heard today, and I think I'm going to pick on Carol, <laughs> um, have you got any more key challenges or opportunities from what you've heard from all the discussions and talks? Is there one that sticks out in particular, either a challenge or an opportunity that you think the Institute members could focus on? Right, and Nick, could I ask you please the same question, just to follow on? Right. Is it dark by the way? No. no. Oh. Would you like me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, do you want to repeat your answer? Or? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. The acoustic options are actually easier. I mean, the, the thing I take away from these events is the, you know, the, the amount of stuff that is going on, on a very broad uh, um, uh, canvas, and um, I suppose that I, I have perseverated with this theme for a while, but I don't know that we uh, brilliantly articulate the, that totality of a collective endeavour uh, as well as we could, and that uh, I think that, Danielle, that should be top on your list of very much is. things <laughs> to do. And because I'd, it's difficult when you're in Cambridge to understand uh, the, the, the breadth of what everyone's up to, let alone if you're outside. So I think better articulating that and, and presenting a narrative of what we're doing and why and how, I think would be good. Great, thank you very much. So moving on to another question we've had, still keeping to the, the future of public health is, um, and Mike, I'm gonna come to you now if you don't mind, is how do you envision global health changing over the next 20 years? These are big questions, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, s first of all, a number of things we've heard um, today, uh, particularly Nick's presentation, I think um, offers an, a number of signposts to us. Um, first, as a set of warnings, and uh, you know, a bit like your um, use of the Walt Disney feature, uh, which, as you say, was remarkably prescient on the technology, but remarkably blind to the um, consequences of the precisely exactly the same technologies. So um, 
First of all, the kinds of issues that you point to in developing countries, especially Africa, um, look to me to be with us already, if not, um, and, and unless and until um, global action is taken, I can't see us reversing those in much the same way as I can't see us um, reversing um, or the inability to see the reversals that were necessary in the 1950s, given what was known then. Um, similarly, the problems uh, in the developed world, I think, are well signposted, well signposted um, some of which have been mentioned today, uh, including antimicrobial resistance, including um, problems associated with climate change, including the problems that are already with us with respect to obesity, um, alcohol misuse, physical activity, and the rest. So at that level, it's a fairly gloomy prediction. But I suppose um, if we take ourselves back to the Walt Disney feature, um, or we take ourselves back to a few years after that, to 1962, when the um, Royal College of Physicians report on tobacco and health was published, there is a sense in which um, the both the um, producers of the Walt Disney film and certainly uh, the authors of the Royal College of Physicians report could have been able to, but didn't, articulate a series of policy proposals which could have changed things more quickly than they did. But two things, I think, prevent that. And we're in the same situation, I think, with respect to the problems that have been identified today. One is, do we have the courage uh, to work through the inferences of what we already know? Um, to, th to almost think the unthinkable. In much the same way that around, uh, I think it was Harold Macmillan's cabinet that would have received um, the Royal College of Physicians report on tobacco, um, they didn't have, weren't able to articulate the imagination to do all the things that were necessary to bring about the tobacco control that we've achieved in the 60 years which have followed. Now, it's a tall order to be able to think yourselves 60 years forward from where you are now um, takes an heroic effort. Um, but there are a lot of smart people who work in public. There's a lot of smart people here in Cambridge. Um, but we don't spend very much time, as it were, thinking um, that that um, the future scenarios and, and future thinking what that might be um, in ways that we might be able to articulate more precisely. But linked to that is a second and equally important point. One of the reasons, of course, Macmillan's cabinet would have shied away from it, even if they had had the imagination to do it, was they didn't have the political will to do it. And the problems that we've been talking about today on a global and a national scale require political will and um, a desire really to do things for the better in the long term. And that's what was missing in 1962, which is why it took 60 years nearly to get to the ban on smoking in public places. We actually can't afford another 60 year wait to deal with these problems because it's, it, the disasters will be upon us. So um, what behoves us, I think, as public health practitioners, public health doctors, uh, public health scientists, is to work on advocacy. Um, certainly within Qu Qu Chris Whitty's terms, with the evidence, but we've got pretty much a lot of that already. Um, but the messages that flow from that, it seems to me, are pretty clear. We have to work with our colleagues in Westminster, in Whitehall, with MPs, with um, local political parties, um, with pressure groups, with vested interests, because if we don't, the future looks pretty grim. Thank you very much. And Katie Kerr, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Just um, well, it, it's sort of a, a side track to that, which is, I think uh, there is a greater need for public health capacity more than ever before, <coughs> particularly when the pressures are on for specialized medicine and individual therapies. And it's even more critical that we train more people who have the kind of skills that we need in public health, which is <coughs> the ability to understand what's going on in health, to be advocates, to have the values of health of the public, but also to have the skills to articulate why it is important to politicians and to general public. And the skills to actually get the evidence, assess the evidence, and keep saying why it's important. And so the training, I think, is critical because we can't anticipate what some of the problems will be in the future. And the problems in different parts of the world are very different but they should have the generic skills to be able to identify these problems 
measure them, say what they are, and to to look for answers in their own context, to have the skills to do this. So a really central issue is actually how we protect public health training and get the next generation um, remove the barriers that we've heard from, from Eleanor to getting the best people into public health. And it's such, such a challenge when actually sometimes it doesn't look very attractive as a career prospect. But yeah. that's what we need globally, not just in the UK, but worldwide. Okay, thank you. And I think Vicky still had a comment. I agree with both both of uh, your comments. I, I just want to follow up on this issue of political will and um, make a comment about the nature of evidence because, um, and I'll, I'll paraphrase from a, a review about uh, diabetes in America where someone was doing a chapter on prevention and they talked all about the randomized controlled trial evidence and then the next statement was, oh, and population approaches might be beneficial, but there's no evidence that they work, so there's no basis for any formulation of public policy. And if you extrapolate that globally, that is a recipe for inaction. And it stems from a misunderstanding of the nature of evidence that informs public health. And I think a very reductionist, Cochrane-esque view that you need evidence and eventually you synthesize the evidence and then you get action. And actually what you need in public health is the best available evidence, action, it, which is the where the political will comes in, and then evaluation. And rather than have politicians say, what should I do? We should turn the question around and say, what are you prepared to do? And are you prepared to subject it to an evaluative framework? Thank you. And just coming back to what KT was saying <laughs> about... <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, you got a mic. Sorry. Just, just on that, Nick, um, Occam's razor, parsimony, teaches us that we assume generality of findings until evidence proves a distinction. Assuming lack of generality with no evidence is flies in the face of the fundamental parsimony notions of evidence. Um, so I, again, I'm agreeing with you, I hope for the same reasons. Um, uh, regarding political will, I find very instructive the experience in the States with regarding to smoking, which was that what really propelled us into action was two Surgeon General's reports within a year or two in the late 80s saying that nicotine is addictive and that pa passive smoking kills. And those two changed the, from you can kill yourself, you can harm yourself, it's none of my business, to this is everybody's business. And I think I was struck by the data earlier this afternoon that global climate change is taking eight months from everybody, uh, if I have the number correct. It, it seems to me the more we can frame, certainly in the states, climate change is still something that happens to them, usually people in poor communities or poor countries. Um, and the more we can frame these things as uh, goring all our oxes, I think uh, the better we can mobilize will. Thank you. So can, I, can I just uh, say, so just following on from all those comments, I think you know, it's incumbent on us to change the narrative. It, so instead of being the reactors, I think this is what you're saying, we need to change the whole narrative, and that involves working with the media, the politicians, the, the localities, and so on. And that only through doing that can we do that. And occasionally, well, what we need to do is find the right levers, the things that are important to those communities that uh, we have the evidence base, we can frame things in ways that um, relate their we can, our, we've got the whole mass of important things, but we can make our profile of the important things fit the needs of the population um, in a better way, I think. In the state's public health view that's been put in order in South Africa, we have a problem. On the floor of my office, there's on the floor where my office sits, I don't have a high floor. Um, <laughs>
and Simon Cullen. So, uh, as I often do, I'd like to agree with Nick and reinforce what he said, um, and just extend it slightly, and that is, um, we're, I think we're constrained by the Cooksey translational pathway and by our desire not to do harm. And uh, that leads us to then need randomized trial evidence to make sure that we are making people better rather than uh, worse. Um, and I think for public health interventions, the likelihood of harm tends to be much less. And I don't think we tap into that when we're talking about the evaluative framework. So if you're much less likely to do harm, uh, and you may do some good, and then you're going to build in an evaluation program to evaluate how much harm, uh, how much good you're actually doing. I think we could be much braver in what we do than, for example, a pharmaceutical company with a new uh, molecule. I'm reminded of David Pension's cartoon, where he has someone um, at a global health, at a, at a uh, global warming conference, saying, uh, uh, "So what happens if we make the world a better place for the wrong reason? Because this global warming was all a hoax." Anyone want to comment further on that? <laughs> uh, what I'd, I'd like to draw a distinction here, actually, between evidence as we like to see, understand, and work with it as, as public health scientists, and evidence as it's used in the political process, because I don't think they're the same things. Um, the focus on, for example, the randomized controlled trial doing as little harm as possible make a huge amount of sense within particular a particular set of um, parameters and protocols about how you do good science. But when you step outside of the academy into the worlds of Whitehall and I guess Washington too, um, and work directly with politicians and policymakers, um, it doesn't really matter, or, or they're much less concerned about the quality of the evidence um, and the quality of the science than they are about a whole range of other factors. Things which drive policy, of, of the many things which drive policy, evidence is but one, um, and it isn't always by any means the most important. Um, we live in a democracy, and what that actually means is all sorts of interests, all sorts of ideas, all sorts of uh, political arguments play in, uh, to which politicians pay attention, um, because they have a, a bigger uh, or rather different goal than the health of the public, which is to get re-elected next time around. Um, and in the world of politics, that makes perfect sense. And if we as scientists lose sight of that reality and the reality of all the other things that are playing, playing in as they make decisions, and we imagine that evidence is, is going to, in some sense, on its own drive policy, then we are forever going to be disappointed. What we have to do instead is work with the grain of that political reality. Um, and it, it, it's what you were working towards, Simon. I think you were talking uh, uh, about how you, how you get on the inside and influence. You don't do it from the outside by simply saying, I've got evidence which shows you are wrong. Because not surprisingly, telling people they're wrong is probably about the least effective behavior change strategy that you can imagine. Um, on the other hand, working with the grain um, of the political process um, is, in the end, a much more productive way um, of, of, of doing that. And, you know, historically, if you look at the sorts of public health measures which were eventually successful in the 19th century, the people who were pushing them forward um, were often in, you, you know, they worked at it for years and years and years and years, um, whether it's Chadwick, whether it's uh, Snow, whether it's um, any of the great public health reformers of that century. And we do well to learn from there. Um, you know, they just didn't give up, even when the politics went against them. Um, and they came back and they tried again and again and again. In a sense, that's what we have to do and not imagine that, there's, that we have an evidence magic bullet that's going to change things because the world just doesn't work like that. Um, and it, it's really, really important to remember that, as I said, because otherwise we'll be forever, ever disappointed. Uh, I think that's the point that Nick was making, is that we have to be opportunistic and make use of all, all yeah. changes in policy as they happen, but have the capacity and the skills to evaluate what their impact is and to publicize it. Um, and, and, you know, things are happening all the time. We're not doing, I, I think that's what public health people should be doing, is assessing the impact of policy as it happens and, and trying to maybe shift it in different ways. 
And I'm very struck there, this is a 1952 great small. The government introduced, on the basis of virtually no evidence except the rise in death, the Clean Air Act. That was a mere massive undertaking. And that was done on just sort of observational data over a period of days of these three tests. So I, I think that, that maybe we're not brave enough about doing things like this and, and just saying, let's do it and see what happens. Thank you. And Charlotte Patterson, I think you've got one. Thanks. So my question actually leads nicely on from the conversation we're having so far, and it is about the tension perhaps between working with the grain, as Mike suggests, and Fiona Godley's suggestion to us that we need to be wary of becoming servants of the state. So uh, David spoke earlier about the importance of both good data and, both, and good oratory, and I'm really struck by the importance of the latter as someone who's come from a research career and is moving into learning the ropes of policy. Health policy attention tends to be captured very much by acute care agendas, often this means things like trolley weights and A&E. And we know that public health budgets have been cut by 200 million in recent years, and we know there's a planned cut of 85 million pounds in the 2017-18 budget coming. So my question is, how do we make the impacts of, public, of cuts to public health services, and therefore on the front line delivery of care uh, for population health, visible to policymakers and politicians in the same way that trolley weights and A&E capture their attention. Yeah, um, I think that's a um, very good question, as they all are. Um, and I, I wonder if it's about the metrics. It's about how we present the evidence. And that we, we tend to... Um, we, well, we, we tend to basically batter the system with the evidence. And just as individuals don't change their behavior when you give them the evidence about lifestyle change, so nor does the system, <coughs> nor, nor do the players in the system. And so I, th I think we need to bring our evidence base together in ways that are far more visible and that the media and social media can engage with in a way that then becomes an entity in itself. You know, it's not us driving it, it's actually the public driving it and saying, why aren't we having more of these things? And we haven't got that, that narrative right. Thank you. Chief. Uh, when the army plans an exercise, they have an estimated butcher's bill. <coughs> I wonder if it's time that we had a ministerial butcher's bill for the costs of the policies that they've introduced. Beneficial, harmful. And, of course, as in prisons, when there's a problem in a prison, they ship the prisoners around the system. When there's a problem in a department, they ship the minister out. But his bill would follow him. Okay. You might have to articulate that uh, analogy slightly more. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you might have the case in butchering the milk. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that public health involves everybody. And, and if you can quantify it, such as the data that David showed, that, that you know, people understand it's not just them, it's all of us together. And I think the more we can spell that out, uh, it's a very selfish approach, but on the other hand, you know, collectively, it, it, it's a big issue. So I think it's being able to tell that story, that, that all these things actually impact on all of us and large numbers of us. Yes, to that. I'm, I haven't seen the programmes, but um, uh, some of you will have watched the filthy, I don't know, the super rich programmes. It's, it's a couple of series, and it's based on Jung Ha's economics books, basically, uh, illustrating the concepts. And they interview the, um, somebody who, who does hedge funds for uh, making the super rich richer. And he, this person is saying, well, look, the super rich don't really want all this inequality either, because they have to live in gated communities and they have bodyguards and all of that. And, you know, they, they would prefer to live in uh, a more equitable society. Now, that sounds a little bit kind of over the top, but, but th there's an element in there which we can catch on to, I think, about uh, what kind of society people want to live in and what kind of society the future looks, you know, what sort of future we're looking at if we go down the worst case scenario. And just to um, Mike, 
uh, mentioned about sort of thinking forward into future scenarios. The Health of the Public 2040 report had a very extensive exercise in doing that, interviewing people about the different types of futures. So there is a, a, um, already a big evidence base out there from a whole load of interviews about thinking forward into the future. So that might, quite, might be quite useful for us to kind of use. Sorry, did you have comments? I was wondering about going back to your question, actually. Because you didn't, I'm not sure you got an answer. So um, I, I think that uh, public health is the, uh, the art of being responsibly responsive. And if we get too much into scaremongery, I think that might work in the short term, but longer term we'll get to find out. So I, you know, I think we have to adopt a middle and honest ground and stick to it and have a clear narrative. But I think things like, you know, stating that sugar is the new tobacco is an exaggeration that eventually is, it might be useful in getting some media attention in the short term, but in the longer term, that's not a helpful narrative because it's not true. So I think it's difficult and trolley weights are important. I mean, they're important for the people who are waiting on the trolley. So we don't, we shouldn't uh, promote public health by, you know, dismissing the importance of those things. It's just giving a, an, an, a, a different but intellectually true narrative, I think. Thank you. And we'll take one last quick question, if that's okay, because we're running out of time, actually. Sorry, we've already got one. <laughs> is, this, uh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, an, an observation and a ch which poses a challenge, I think, following on from the conversation of uh, conflict of interest, political will, uh, the primacy of, uh, of evaluation, uh, the fact that we've not perhaps uh, dwelt on the devolution of public health into local authorities, which are political organisations. Uh, and uh, touching on Simon's work on the NHS health checks, I have experience in unnamed local authority of uh, trying to evaluate uh, based on good data. But if the, if the messages are not, uh, you know, poli particularly politically palatable uh, in terms of the findings, uh, you know, a roadblock is, is put up. Uh, and this as a challenge in terms of, you know, developing research capacity uh, and crossover with services and academia. Uh, how can we overcome this if this is a, a, a new obstacle we're encountering? Any reflections on that? Is that a good place to stop? <laughs> 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 give a, a, a quick example. So we published those findings on dementia e prevalence going down age for age, which was not the anticipated increase that had been modeled uh, within the system, as it were, and, the poli and uh, was very successfully worked with and so on. The NHS was given the estimates using the old um, the old figures, and it became highly political about the use of the updated figures from a publicly funded study. You know, and so there were some people sort of saying that oh, that's rubbish, that's, that research is rubbish. Um, and yes, it was the most up contemporary, up to date stuff uh, it, uh, evidence for dementia. So we worked behind the scenes. We worked with the DH. We worked with Public Health England. We worked with N um, NHS England. And after a period of time, when the, poli the political bit heat was off, the new figures were introduced quietly. So, and at that, that to a huge sigh of relief from the primary care, who were working on targets which were based on the previous estimation. So, it can be done, but you have to kind of find your ways. That was just an illustration. Great. So I think on that note, in the interest of time, we'll have to bring the panel to a close. So thank you so much for taking all those questions. Let's just thank them again. Thank you. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all our speakers, the discussions and the questions. I don't know about you, but it's been incredibly thought-provoking. Um, and I'd just like to thank you all again for your participation. So thank you. Thank you.